It's the 28th of October 2021 and welcome to the Water Action Platform. Following the recent participation of people from El Salvador, this platform now has engagement from a staggering 96 countries. And this month we have a very special broadcast as we're going to Latin America. Rodrigo Valderes from Mexico is going to host today's broadcast and has some wonderful stories to share, ranging from tunnel inspection robots to the use of air bubble blankets in reservoirs. Of course, we also have Joe Burgess, who this month, following requests from a number of you, will focus on long COVID. And if you stick it out to the very end, you will get to hear me attempt the Water Action Platform tagline in my very best Spanish. The Water Action Platform was launched in March 2020 with the help of these lovely sponsors to share learning from across the global water sector about COVID-19. As the months passed, we broadened the scope. And in a recent broadcast, I proposed that the Water Action Platform should now focus on the even bigger challenge that our industry and the world is facing, namely the climate crisis. Your feedback was both effusive and brilliant and very supportive of this shift. We will, of course, continue to share relevant updates on the pandemic, but our editorial team are now hunting down those best practice stories which will ensure that the water sector will achieve carbon net zero as quickly as possible and with, and with as little risk as possible. So with that in mind, next month I will share details of a new initiative, the Trial Reservoir, which personally I think is the most exciting thing to happen in the water sector for a generation and has the potential to be a significant leap forward in our approach to the climate crisis. I hope you will join me for that. As a neat segue to that and also to our Latin American theme this week, let's start today's broadcast with a couple of environmental crisis stories from the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean Sea. There are two major environmental catastrophes looming in that part of the world and Due to the potential impact that they could have on all of us, we need to be aware of them. The aim of me sharing them today is simply to raise awareness of these issues, which we don't feel catch enough of the media attention. The first is this, the Gulf of Mexico dead zone. This is a huge area at the mouth of the Mississippi where the water is hypoxic, i.e. it has less than two parts per million dissolved oxygen. It is one of the largest hypoxic areas in the world. This dead zone is caused by nutrient enrichment from the Mississippi River, in particular nitrogen and phosphorus. And the size of it varies depending on the river flow and precipitation, which of course is now more variable due to climate change. This year, scientists predict that this dead zone will be 6,000 square miles in size. The key to minimizing the Gulf's dead zone is, of course, to address the problem at source use fewer fertilizers to limit excessive runoff, control animal waste entering waterways, and monitor sewage treatment facilities to reduce the nutrient discharges. The Gulf of Mexico's dead zone is an environmental problem that we all need to know about. To share more details about the second problem in this part of the world, I'm going to hand over to Rodrigo Valderes, based in Mexico City. Rodrigo, as mentioned earlier, will host the rest of this Latin American themed broadcast. Over to you, Rodrigo. Thank you very much, Piers. Now, we're going to move a bit south in the map and locate ourselves in the Caribbean Sea, close to Cancun, a very well-known place in the Mayan Riviera. A second issue found to be of great concern in today's edition is sargasso or sargassum. In recent years, the massive influx of sargassum to the coasts of the Caribbean Sea has generated great interest in the scientific community highlighting the urgency of addressing its potential uses and final disposal. Accumulations of sargassum occur naturally in coastal areas, although in smaller quantities than the atypical arrival occurring since 2011, with a maximal accumulation of more than 20 million metric tons observed in June 2018 in the Caribbean area. To your left, you can see pictures of the accumulation and decomposition of sargasso in Mexican beaches in the last six years. The suggested causes for the increase in sargasso biomass include an increase in the nutrient load due to deforestation and other land use changes, an increase in Sahara dust, an increase in the sea temperature, among others. All factors may be ultimately linked 
to human modification of the biogeochemical cycles. This map shows the massive influx of sargassum on the coast of the Mexican Caribbean from 2014 to 2020. It is pretty much everywhere. The increasing invasion of sargassum has caused adverse effects on human health, the ecosystems there, as well as on tourism. Effective long-term management strategies are needed to deal with the harmful impacts. The images you see here show you different stages of the process to remove sargasso from the beaches and separate and recover sand. It has become a major regular activity. In the framework of circular economy, sargassum are good candidates for use as a resource, and biorefinery is a strategy that allows the full use of biomass, potentially obtaining biogas, biofertilizer, alginate, and fine chemicals. However, knowledge of the biomass adequate composition is required in order to exploit its full value. For example, researchers in the Yucatan Center for Scientific Research in Mexico have identified for the first time the presence of lignin in sargassum, a polymer that gives plants its structure and support. This knowledge will allow the design of more efficient pretreatment strategies to access the valuable compounds offered by sargassum. We now come to our COVID section with Joe Burgess. Hi everyone and welcome back. This month I'm going to explain some new data on what's currently known about long COVID in breakthrough cases. A new study that came out just last month in The Lancet showed that adults who've received a full vaccination, so two doses if it's a two-dose uh, vaccine, are 49% less likely to have long COVID should they contract a COVID-19 infection. Researchers analysed data from more than 2 million volunteer participants, and these people were logging their symptoms, their tests, what vaccines they'd had between December 2020 and July 2021, and the study included people with no vaccines, with one dose, and fully vaccinated adults. The researchers assessed a range of co-factors, including age, um, socioeconomic status, immune system, uh, frailty, and they compared symptoms and outcomes of disease, both before vaccination and with post-vaccination infection. Of the 2 million people, 1.2 reported receiving a first dose of vaccine during the study, and of those people, 0.5% subsequently tested positive for SARS-CoV-2. Almost 1 million went on to get their second dose during the study period, and of those people, 0.2% subsequently tested positive. Many of those people weren't even ill. <laughs> so what happened to that 0.2% of people that had breakthrough cases? This figure compares what the vaccinated COVID-19 sufferers reported compared to the unvaccinated, and it looked at hospitalisation, about the longevity of the disease, so did the symptoms last for more than a month, whether they had lots of symptoms at once, more than five, and whether or not they were asymptomatic. The dotted line represents the reporting rate of these four factors among COVID-19 sufferers who became ill before being vaccinated. So that's what's considered to be the normal rate. The red dots indicate the rate of recurrence of each of those things among people who'd had one vote vaccine dose out of two, and the blue dots show the rate of occurrence of those things with people that tested positive after receiving both of their shots. And what you can see is that in the very unlikely event of catching COVID-19 after being fully vaccinated, the risk of long COVID is reduced by nearly 50%, so it's halved. There were 73% fewer hospitalizations among vaccinated breakthrough cases than in unvaccinated cases, and a much lower burden of acute symptoms, 31% less likely, among those fully vaccinated. Because this study tested all the more than 2 million participants and not only those who reported symptoms, they also found out that people that test positive for SARS-CoV-2 after vaccination are twice as likely to have no symptoms. So a lot of these people were unaware that they'd caught COVID-19 at all. Now this list shows that the nature of the common symptoms that were reported were similar between the unvaccinated and the vaccinated adults. Things like loss of smell, cough, fever, headaches, and fatigue. But all of the symptoms were milder, they're all to the left of the line, and less frequently reported by the people who were vaccinated. And they were half as likely to have multiple symptoms during their illness. 
Interestingly, the one exception is sneezing. Sneezing is more commonly reported after one dose than after no doses or two doses, and nobody knows why yet. So vaccinations are reducing the chance of people getting long COVID in two ways. First, it reduces the risk of having any symptoms by eight or tenfold. And second, it halves your chances of any infection turning into long COVID, even if it does happen. So this is great news. Back to you. Thank you, Joe. For our technology showcase section, and staying with today's focus in Latin America, I would like to present to you two Chilean technologies. The first technology has been developed by Aguas Andinas, Santiago's utility, in a joint R&D effort. To talk about their tunnel inspection robot, I leave you with Diego Olivares from Aguas Andinas. Hello, I'm Diego Olivares, Head of Innovation of Aguas Andinas. Aguas Andinas is the West Utility of Santiago de Chile, and we provide services to more than 7 million people. When you operate in the whole urban water cycle, you have many challenges, and for these challenges, our company adopts an environmental strategy and a circular economy model for maximizing the efficiency in the use of water, other resources, and byproducts. It's important to us because in the last 10 years, we're particularly affected for the climate variability with the sustained water scarcity for the decrease in rainfalls. One way to resolve this problem is to be more efficient with the water resource, reduction of the leaks, and improve the resiliency of our water supply network. The aqueducts are critical infrastructure that transport drinking water for our production plants to the distribution tanks. They are large at all pipelines and they are located in mountainous areas with difficult access to inspection. We tested some technology, but we don't have good results because the high speed of the water and the high friction force inside and the pipelines. In this case, conducting a traditional inspection to diagnose the pipeline condition could be not possible. Not only because the access is difficult and dangerous, also requires a large inter interruption of the water supply in the city. The objective of this project was develop a remote control device that would allow the inspection and diagnosis of the structural condition of the aqueducts in operation without interruption of the service and the water supply to the city. How we do that? We made some scouting for some developers that currently provide inspection service in important sector of the Chilean economy. Intel is a robotic company that carried out inspection in the mining industry in Thailand ponds and we found a good partner for this challenge. Results are very positive. We achieved the access, inspection, and diagnosis of our aqueducts with a good performance. The robot had an excellent navigation in a clockwise direction that allows recording information for access the structural condition of the pipeline. We achieved one kilometer distance for inspection since any manhole, and we developed a complementary solution for make more efficient destruction of the ROV in the field works. Now, now we are developing a new prototype, more aerodynamic for the operation in stronger conditions, up to 3.5 uh, meters per second of water speed in the aqueduct, and will be tested in 20 kilometers. Our partnership with Magintel is another highlight, with a good business model for both parties. Something has financed 50% of the prototype and provides conditions to generate a long-term inspection service for Magintel and receives federal commercial rights, such as royalty on another inspection to other companies and conditions to acquire equipment uh, and a new inspection service. The second technology today, PSP Soluciones, is a Chilean technology company in the aquaculture sector that enables the harmless use of air bubble curtains to keep away polluting particles that may affect the productive processes. Luis Sepúlveda from PSP Soluciones will tell us more about their technology. Hi, I'm Luis Sepúlveda and I represent Lobo2 Water Aeration Solutions. I'm going to present a proven and tested micro bubble barrier system for mitigation of algae blooms. Our Lobo2 laminar flow micro bubble barriers consist of a pneumatic network of high quality compressed air. Through our high-tech pipeline diffuser, it allows the uniform generation of millions of microbubbles per linear meter, which rise vertically to the surface, without generating coalescence and without bursting in their ascent. The ascent of these bubbles create an ascending current of water by drag, 
which together allow to generate a true wall which blocks the passage of undesirable elements in the sea or any other body of water, such as microalgae, algae, jellyfish, larvae, seeds, oil spill, litter, etc. We recommend the permanent use of our lead system for these intakes because it not only blocks algae bloom and jellyfish, it also reduces the suction of phytoplankton and soil plankton in the intakes, minimizing fouling in pipes and backwashing, minimizing the discharge of inert organic material into the aquatic environment. What are the main benefits? Environmental care. It contributes to safeguarding the balance of marine ecosystem. It protects marine biodiversity. It benefits communities and different sectors such as artisanal fishing and marine tourism and protects people's health. The permanent use of our system allows reducing OPEX significantly for several industrial processes, such as desalination. Where are the main benefits? Less energy consumption, less use of chemicals, less maintenance and cleaning costs, less changes of membranes and filters, less no program stops. We have estimated savings for a typical desalination plant of one cubic meter per second of around one to 1.5 million dollars per year. This is a proven and tested and well positioned solution in the international aquaculture market with more than 160 projects implemented in the last five years. We have a project recently installed in an intake of a desalination plant in the north of Chile and under evaluation in different countries. We have a blocking effectiveness of over 80% for algae blooms measured in the aquaculture industry and validated by University Austral of Chile and Planton Andino Laboratory. We have a specialized engineering, know-how, service, training and after sales support and we have an integrated biological area as a fundamental pillar in engineering development. I guess with our technology, I hope we can contribute for the sustainability of this industry. And next, in our sector experts section, Pierce will interview Sergio Campos, head of the Water and Sanitation Division at the Inter-American Development Bank. The IDB supports Latin American and Caribbean economic development social development, and regional integration. They address three main challenges, social inclusion and equality, productivity and innovation, and economic integration, bearing in mind climate change and environmental sustainability. Can you tell me, what do you think are the main challenges and the sort of needs within the water and sanitation sector in Latin America in particular? Uh, In regards to the challenges for Latin America, uh, mostly related to access, uh, access to water and sanitation, Uh, 25 to 30 percent of the population in Latin America don't have a continuous source of water. Uh, They don't have a drinkable water, according to the Sustainable Development Goals. That's about 200 million people. Uh, And uh, in sanitation, it's almost two-thirds of the Latin American populations that don't have access to adequate slash management. So that's about 400 million people or a bit more. Uh, and then, but it's not only access, it's also the vulnerability to climate change. Access and climate change are sort of the two main challenges that we, we, we face ahead. But that, that also includes financing, we estimate that we need approximately $20 billion in order to meet the sustainable development goals by 2030, 20, million, 20 billion per year, and Latin America's investing half. There are important uh, changes that need to be addressed in terms of governance, not only strengthening regulators and policy making, but actually the corporate governance of public utilities, and of course, innovation. How innovative do you think Latin America is? Um, the same way Latin America is 
is the region that has the the highest amount of fresh water. Latin America has one third of the fresh water in the world, but we have extremely dry areas. And, um, there's also a dichotomy in terms of which countries are moving forward with innovation. You have Brazil, Argentina, Chile, and Colombia that are innovating fast and well, but we have other countries that are not in, are not innovating or are not adopting innovation as fast. No, and I know that the IEDB has got an initiative that you've designed specifically to support innovation in the water sector. Can you just talk a little to that? Of course, what we're doing is uh, we might, we want to send a signal to the region that the game changer is innovation. But it's not innovation only linked to technology. It's innovation that has uh, innovation in governance, uh, innovation in social aspects. It needs to be, it needs to be holistic because uh, because social innovation and uh, technical innovation are the ones that are more powerful to address the needs that we're talking. And what's the bank doing? Are you offering funding then to support these initiatives? Is that how it works? What we did is we 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 talked to uh, partners. We're, we're we're setting up resources from the IDB and the innovation arm of the IDB, which is the IDB Lab, uh, and we're creating uh, a pool of funds that are going to be solely dedicated for innovation. We're mainly focusing in, in four types of uh, projects. Uh, one of them is uh, bringing ideas to incubation, and we're mostly doing that through e-hackathons. Uh, we did last year one for informal settlements. Uh, we're also fostering a project that we had for 10 years, which is Premius Bit FEMSA, in which we award uh, incubation or entrepreneurs. Uh, we're having, we also have um, challenges, and those are, we're awarding innovations that public utilities in Latin America are developing to address their own needs. Uh, and, and fourth, we are bringing innovation from the, out, from, the, from, from the other regions in the world. And what's your invitation for people to engage on this? How, how can you, how can we help? Uh, we need to make a focus in public utilities or in utilities, not only in public utilities. Private utilities are innovating. Innovation is coming from the private sector. Uh, so, But most of the service provision is in the hands of public utilities worldwide. So they need to embrace innovation. And the multilaterals and companies like yours need to mainstream, help them mainstream innovation. In Latin America, only 10% of the utilities have an innovation plan. Wow. Only 20% of the of the of the utilities have an innovation department. Oh, they do they do have the old uh, research and development, but they need to embrace innovation. There are things that are being developed somewhere else that can be can be brought in. There are two sets of innovations: innovations that can be developed in house to address a specific problem, but there are other innovations that are no-brainers. Things that have been already developed that are proven that are good and that can be adapted at a minimal cost and can address uh, problems in a much faster way. We look forward to continue working along with the IDB to bring innovation and best practices to the water sector in Latin America. And finally, I want to talk to you about Waterlight. This lamp has been designed in conjunction with Wunderman, Thompson, Colombia, and Irina. It provides energy from just half a liter of salt water and has won three Cannes Lion Awards in 2021. The designer is Miguel Mojica, a designer from Colombia who undertook a master's in product design in Spain. The device uses ionization of an electrolyte, a salt solution or seawater that the user can refill and can operate for 30 to 45 days on a single charge. This process makes it possible to produce light as well as to recharge phones and batteries with the clean and renewable energy generated. The working principle is a new, but the industrial design of a product that is safe to handle, lightweight, and made mostly of bamboo, is a great way to take light and communication to rural communities or into crisis response situations. We go back to you, Piers. Thank you, Rodrigo. A water-powered light, who'd have thought it possible? 
With that, we come to the end of this week's webinar. Thanks again to our sponsors and contributors. In particular this week, I'd like to acknowledge the support of Abcon and Syncom from Latin America. Please join us next month when our broadcast will have a climate related theme aligned to COP26. As mentioned earlier, I will share news of possibly the most exciting thing to happen in innovation in the water sector for 30 years. Trust me, you really don't want to miss it. Our next webinar will be on Thursday, the 24th of November at the usual times. Sigan hacienda preguntas. Sigan compart yendo. Cuidense.